por portion of the march is going to meet up at 11 a.m. at 66th Street and Central Park West. Um, with that, if anyone wants to grab uh, some of the signs back there in the red and black signs that say climate change is a health crisis, we'll be there, we'll be with the banners, and you'll probably see a lot of folks wearing white coats uh, out there um, representing health professionals. So thank you for holding that. <laughs> uh, there are also a number of materials out there on the health impacts of climate change. Feel free to take some on your way up. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Wendy is first? Okay. <laughs> Dr. Wendy Ring. Hi, Wendy. Hi. Okay, I'm going to be relying heavily on this mic because I've got a cold and I've lost my voice. So can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, you know, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change puts out a series of reports every five years, which is sort of the best knowledge that we have about what's happening and what we think is going to happen. And um, this is the cover of the report on human impacts. This, is, this was um, from this March. And I just want to show you two graphs that, um, that were part of this report because I think it sums it up very nicely. Um, this is the first one. And, um, and it's looking at the risk for health impacts in North America. And um, I want to pull out four points from this. Um, the, um, the bars are the, um, the degree, the severity of, of um, health impact, and the hatched area is um, how much we can decrease it by adaptation. So, um, so the first point is, you can see there's a pretty big bar there at the present. Um, climate change is already having health effects in North America. Um, second, we can adapt somewhat, but we cannot avoid those health impacts. Uh, third, if you look at the near-term um, columns there, we are locked in to increase warming and health effects to 2040 because of the emissions that we have already put into the atmosphere. Um, so we're paying for our previous inaction. And then lastly, of course, the decisions that we make today uh, will have a great impact on, um, on our health. We're looking, looking from uh, 2080 to 2100. Now this is the second graph, and um, this is this is a um, showing different scenarios, emission scenarios with the decreases um, in emissions undertaken at different times and to different degrees. And you notice that all of them except the green one are kind of faded out, and that's because the scientists and we're, we're talking about uh, you know over 300 scientists from 70 countries who put together this particular report all agree that there really is only one way to um, to, to keep our our um, planet's temperature under two degrees centigrade and that involves um, that emissions peak by 2020 and that developed countries do it sooner and um, and faster so the bad news is that's not the line that we're following right now. But the good news is, is that if we can get onto that green path, we're going to see not only um, improvements in the health of the planet, but also probably save the lives in the U.S. of hundreds of thousands of people. And I'm going to explain to you how, why that is. But I've got to tell you some stories first. Um, and I, I have to apologize. These are all white guy stories because um, I think... I went looking on the internet to find them, and white guys are kind of overrepresented on the internet. So if anybody has other stories to share with me that I could use, I would love to have them. Um, but this is a Sam Moody, and he actually is an executive for a car insurance company. But um, he gave up commuting. I'm sorry, he gave up commuting by car and lost 70 pounds in the process. And he says that he was, during one of the gas crises, he was in a long line at the gas station, um, turning his car off and on, waiting to get to the pump, and he thought there's got to be a better way. So he decided to take advantage of something called commuter choice um, tax credit, which is a way that employers can give um, pre-tax dollars to employees for van pooling and transit and even um, riding bicycle to work. So he got, I think, about 180 bucks a month and, um, and started riding riding the, the train. He says that he started losing weight because he had a two-mile walk to and from the station every day, and, um, and then he lost some more weight because the train didn't stop at Wendy's. <laughs> so, um, so this is really a huge um, transformation for just from taking advantage of that one um, tax credit and changing his way of getting to work. And he enjoyed it so much that he sold his car. So he's probably the only person at 
the car insurance agency that doesn't own his own vehicle. Oh, this is Steve Groff. He's a, a farmer. He grows vegetables on about 200 acres in um, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. About 14 years ago, he was losing um, huge amounts of uh, topsoil. He decided to change his uh, farming methods, and uh, and so he instituted um, crop rotation, um, no-till agriculture, and um, and some other um, measures. And as a result of that, um, his soil the soil stabilized the organic content increased by about 80 percent and his yields went up um, ten, about 10 percent and, and best of all his expenses went down because he didn't need nearly as much um, synthetic fertilizer and uh, pesticides so now when he grows his vegetables um, he's pulling carbon out of the air putting it into the soil and growing healthy food for us to eat and um, this is a um, is this something that happened? Um, actually, there have been two of them, um, but there's a section of, uh, of the 405 freeway, which is a big freeway in Los Angeles that has about 300,000 cars pass through it every day, and it had to be shut down for repairs, and um, there were all kinds of um, predictions about the chaos that would ensue, but actually what happened was that within minutes of that shutdown, um, the air pollution improved dramatically. So the ultra-fine particulates, those very small particles, um, went down about 83%, and, um, and the um, fine particulates went down 36%. ER visits dropped at two major hospitals, and 911 calls also went down. And this was not just along the freeway corridor. This was for a 100-mile radius around. Um, and then this, this guy is, this is Jeffrey Thompson, he's a neonatologist, he's also the CEO of Gunderson Lutheran Health System, which is a, um, a multi-hospital um, health system that's based out of La Crosse, Wisconsin, and I, I um, went through there on our, one of our bike trips across the country, and, and that's how I learned about them. And um, hospitals are one of the most energy intensive operations in the country. We're responsible, healthcare is responsible for about 8% of all greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. And, um, and it's very expensive for them too. And they were they were facing back in 2007. They were facing having to raise their patient charges because the energy costs were going up by about three hundred thousand dollars a year. And um, they're a nonprofit hospital. So so Jeffrey said, you know, we asked ourselves, what's our mission? Um, is to improve the health of the community. And um, and we can't do that by um, causing environmental damage and, um, and we have a responsibility to keep prices down. So they embarked on a, um, a major um, efficiency effort and they started out with, um, oops, let me go, okay, I guess I'm missing one. They started out just improving energy efficiency in the hospital and, um, and then they, they, um, they set a goal that they were going to be 100% um, clean energy by 2015. They went in with local dairy farmers on a manure, manure biodigester. Um, they, they built a wind farm, um, put solar panels up everywhere, and they um, also, uh, my favorite, um, they, they um, entered into a cooperative agreement with the local brewery and the, um, the organic waste and the, um, and the um, methane that would come off at the end of the brewing process they used for um, for a heat and generation for one of their hospitals. So I'm telling you these stories because um, these are sort of visions of the future. Um, these are like scouts that are out ahead of the main traveling party and they're showing us a future um, which is very desirable where our children will be healthier and live longer than their parents. Um, it's not, as I said before, the path that we're on, but if we can get on that path, we have um, very much to gain. So um, before we can start talking about the future, we have to look at the present and how we got to where we are. So, um, and uh, I like to make my audiences participate, so <laughs> um, who, here, who here can uh, identify the, uh, the major cause of death in the U.S.? Heart disease. Yeah, yeah, heart disease. What's next, do you think? Wild guesses are encouraged. Just shout something out. Cancer. Cancer. Yeah. After that. Lungs. Yeah. Okay. Next. You, said the, you guys are having all the answers. It's just the order. Um, so stroke, part of the cardiovascular disease. Then we've got the unintentional injury. That's the car accidents are in there, and that's the majority of them. Um, Alzheimer's. That was a surprise to me. Diabetes. 
um, renal disease, low respiratory infection, and suicide. So what, you know, we've got to drill down from there and say, what are the causes of the causes of death? And uh, this is from the World Health Organization's list for developed countries. And um, I put all the ones in orange. Um, I colored them that way because they are ones that will all um, improve with um, healthy energy policy. And then let's go to the causes of the causes of the causes of death. Okay. Um, air pollution, car century built environment, and industrial agriculture. So we'll take those one by one. Air pollution um, causes asthma, cancer, heart disease, um, and now we know also obesity and diabetes. And what's the number one cause of air pollution? Motor vehicles. Number two, fossil fuel burning power plants. And that's, and our, that's our number one cause of, of uh, climate change. And um, so we're looking at climate change. What that does is that just begets more air pollution. We've got dust storms, wildfires, um, elevated pollen, and, um, and increased ozone levels. And um, this is just showing you um, how ozone goes up with increased temperature. And, uh, and a prediction that was done um, on a study for New York City on how many more emergency room visits we, we expect to see by 2020 just from climate related increases in ozone. Um, we also know that children are very sensitive and if they um, play outdoor sports in areas that have air pollution, it triples their risk of getting asthma. And um, also ozone causes um, increased premature deaths in adults. And you can see there um, the difference between 2000 and 2020 in terms of what we're looking at. U.S. is second highest after Asia. And, and um, here's sort of two futures. Um, depending on which, uh, what course of action we take in terms of uh, how much ozone we'll be seeing by the end of the century. Um, increased pollen um, is an effect of CO2, um, also makes uh, uh, poison ivy grow more and be, um, and be more, um, cause more itching. Um, more mold because of heavy rainfall, which we know if kids are exposed when they're young, um, nearly doubles their risk of developing asthma. And, um, and you can see the rates that have been increasing. It's nearly tripled um, since the 1960s and still going up. Um, in out west where I come from, um, we're having a lot more dust storms because of drought, and we are in an epidemic of um, valley fever, which is a fungal uh, lung infection. And um, this, is, this is something that is a concern, I think, for areas like New York. Um, there's a seasonal relationship between children's blood lead levels and, um, and temperature and um, and moisture. So if you have dry, if you have hot, dry summers, um, there's more lead dust in the air, and kids breathe that in. And um, and we still have that as a legacy from um, from leaded gasoline and from um, industrial operations like smelters. Uh, wildfires. Um, you may think you don't have to worry about, um, but here's the smoke map of uh, fires in Ontario from this summer, um, and the smoke get reaching all the way to New York City. Travels thousands of miles. And uh, just to show you, Los Angeles has has the dubious um, honor of uh, having the worst air quality in the U.S. And you can see the comparison um, between a wildfire day and a um, non-wildfire day. So the fires make things very much worse. Um, they also um, put out um, uh, harmful chemicals like dioxins, which travel, which attach to those particles, and then um, drop onto grazing land. And, um, and, and our major exposure is through meat and milk. Um, our car-centric transportation system um, is also responsible for a number of health problems. Um, it's, we, um, we used to uh, have a big network of uh, interurban electric trolleys, and you could actually get from Boston all the way down to New York, or from upstate New York all the way to Wisconsin just riding those trolleys. Um, and then um, we transitioned to automobiles, and up until 2000, um, driving more and more miles. And we moved from neighborhoods that had streets that were in a grid where it was easy to get where you were going to um, sub subdivisions uh, where you had to have a car. And we have paid very heavily for that. About one third of our major diseases, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, um, and several um, very common kinds of cancer are directly um, a result of that physical inactivity. So we're spending right now about 75 cents of every dollar on these preventable chronic diseases that are the result of, um, of these decisions that we made um, about our, our transportation system and our, and our um, energy systems and our food systems as well. So um, I just want to show you this because 
that cars are the largest source of transportation emissions. I, everyone thinks it's airplanes, but it's cars just because we have so many of them. Um, so that causes more global warming um, and, um, and more, more heat waves and, and, um, and high numbers of deaths from that. In uh, 2003 in Europe, about 70,000 people died in a heat wave. We're also seeing um, increase in exertional heat injuries in athletes, mostly in young athletes. And, um, and we've had a more than a double increase in the deaths in children um, who left in hot cars. And uh, there's been some urban heat islands. It's just a way of saying that it's hotter in cities than it is in rural areas because of all of the um, asphalt and cement. And the temperature increases, some recent research shows, can be up to 27 degrees hotter than surrounding rural areas. Oh, shoot me, I didn't turn off my phone. I'll just ignore it. Um, <laughs> Uh, none of this stuff, the health effects of climate change are not fair and they impact more heavily on um, elderly people with chronic diseases, people of color, and, um, and that's true for heat deaths, it's also true for asthma and, and many, other, uh, many other health impacts. So again, uh, looking at the difference between uh, climate action and business as usual in terms of the number of um, extremely hot days that we'll be seeing um, between now and the end of the century. We're also seeing increased spread of uh, insect-borne diseases. Um, when the temperatures are warmer, that means, especially if you have a mild spring and fall, that's a longer time that um, the insects can breed. Um, when it's warmer, they mature faster. Viruses that they're carrying multiply faster. Um, their their um, biting and um, host-seeking behavior increases, and they're able to move into territories where they couldn't survive before. And then additionally for ticks, which depend on um, going through a cycle where they have other animals that they uh, that are hosts for them before they get to us, um, the more um, weather conditions increase those populations, the more um, impact we see. Chikungunya is something that's been in the news. This is an insect-borne disease. And, um, and New York City is uh, at really high risk because, the, because of travel. We have the highest number here of travelers that are coming from um, the Caribbean and bringing chikungunya with them. So you've got mosquitoes, you've got chikungunya in travelers, and so it's really a matter of time before we have uh, major outbreaks. What's, what's going for us right now is that there are two types of mosquitoes that carry that, and, um, and we have the, the variant that we have that showed up in Florida can only be transmitted by Aedes aegypti, um, which is not up here. Um, but there's another strain which can be transmitted by Aedes albopictus, and so if that one arrives here, then that's when the trouble begins. And then this is just a little map showing you in the northeast uh, what we're looking at in terms of increased areas where those mosquitoes will be able to live. I'm sorry I'm going fast. You can't examine them. No problem. Um, so industrial food system is the last part that I want to bring up, and this is, this is actually, in terms of our public health, um, a significant, and in terms of global warming. Uh, we had, from the 1970s on, a big change in farm policy. Our government used to control farm prices by paying farmers not to grow food and by buying up the excess and holding on to it. Um, but in the 70s, they had, um, they had a big uh, turnaround, and um, Earl Buss was the Secretary of Agriculture then, and he told the farmers, plant hedgerow to hedgerow, get big or get out. And they uh, encouraged him to take a lot of loans um, and uh, buy lots of machinery and, um, and more land and, and kind of pushed the farming from family farms to uh, large agribusinesses that only would grow one crop, um, government subsidized, and highly dependent on inputs of um, fuel and, and uh, pesticides. So we're, we're looking right now at um, a kind of a direct consequence of that. Um, on the, where it says advise there, that's hard, the Harvard Healthy Plate, which is um, sort of like the USDA's Healthy Plate, except it doesn't have milk in the glass. Um, and that's what we're recommended to eat. Uh, but we're spending about 60, 63% of our subsidy dollars on something that's supposed to take up less than a quarter of our plate. And we're spending um, less than 1% on what's supposed to make up half of our plate. So the, the impacts of those policies um, really go all the way to the supermarket. We saw um, price increases going um, for, for fresh fruits and vegetables and price decreases, um, particularly for fats and oils, sugar and soft drinks. And, um, and we, uh, we had a, a significant increase in the number of calories the average American gets in their diet from sugar and um, an uh, increase in uh, consumption of high fructose corn syrup. 
So by about 2000, uh, we, we had, the average American was consuming 500 calories more a day than they had in 1970. Largely from stuff that's not good for you. And, um, and, as, and this is what we're looking at as a result. We have had a huge increase in obesity. And um, this is probably not what Secretary Butts meant when he said, get big or get out, but um, this is where it's brought us. So what impact does that dietary pattern have on us? Um, increased consumption of red meat and corn syrup, corn sugar increases heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and obesity, and, um, and also um, asthma. Oh, I didn't put that slide in. And we're also looking at those very same agricultural practices um, cause, cause more global warming. So methane, um, it's this, after the fossil fuel industry, that's our second largest contribution is from agriculture and um, from enteric uh, fermentation. And then, and then um, nitrous oxide, 75% of all the nitrous oxide, this is 300 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. 75% of it um, comes from the agricultural practices, mostly um, fossil fuel-based fertilizers. So it's huge. And, um, and there are other impacts, of course, when we have drought, um, food prices go up, people go hungry, um, and then we have some food safety issues, which I think I don't have time to go into yet. Um, so you've got that agricultural runoff, and then you've got warm water, so we have blue-green algae blooms, and uh, this summer Toledo had to shut off, uh, advise uh, almost half a million people not to drink, not to bathe in their water, because it had a toxin from an algae bloom um, that 